Hello, and welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Adriana Lazarescu, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. With me in the GI 101 studios today is my co-host, Dr. Dan Sadowski. Dan, have you brought a case to discuss today? Yes, I have. Okay, let's get started. So, I was asked to see a 20-year-old male for severe symptoms after eating. For the past two years, he has been experiencing episodes of nausea, epigastric fullness, along with abdominal cramps and pain. And these typically occur within 10 to 20 minutes after finishing a meal. And sometimes the cramps result in sudden and urgent watery diarrhea. Along with the abdominal symptoms, he also finds that he will feel lightheaded and that his heart will race in his chest. Did he notice anything else? Well, within an hour or two of eating, he would also begin to feel rather jittery and shaky. And sometimes he would find that he would be sweating. Okay. Are any particular foods more prone to produce these symptoms? Well, that's interesting you should ask. He actually found that sugary drinks such as fruit juices are particularly bad. And then, when I was asking him about this, he volunteered a piece of information that I think sealed the diagnosis in my mind. He told me that his mother is diabetic, and on one occasion when she saw him sweaty and shaky after a meal, she actually tested his blood sugar and found that it was low. Hmm, that's very interesting. Is there any past surgical history of note? Yes. At age 17, the patient required a Nissan fundoplication for treatment of severe esophageal reflux and regurgitation. The symptoms now seem to begin sometime after the surgery. I should also mention that apart from the surgery, he's otherwise healthy, and the physical exam was unremarkable. Well, I agree with you that the clues for the most likely diagnosis are found in the details of the history. But before we get to that, it would be useful for our listeners to review some of the basic principles of gastric emptying as I believe that it will prove to be relevant for this case. Okay, sure. So, it's important to know that the stomach handles the emptying of liquids and solids somewhat differently. First, let's talk about liquids. The emptying of liquids is governed primarily by the proximal stomach, and the fundus in particular. In response to swallowed liquids, the fundus actually undergoes a process known as receptive accommodation or relaxation. And this process is under active control of the vagus nerve and results in an expansion in the volume of the fundus, which slows the emptying of liquids from the stomach. And then, at an appropriate time, the fundus contracts to empty the liquids in a controlled fashion. The emptying of solids, on the other hand, is primarily governed by the antrum, which undergoes the typical contraction and mixing movements, which reduces the food particle size to allow passage through the pylorus. This aspect of gastric emptying is also under control of the vagus nerve. It sounds like the vagus nerve has an important function in gastric emptying. That's correct. The vagus nerve has a profound impact on gastrointestinal motility and disruption of vagal function typically results in rapid emptying of liquids and delayed emptying of solids. So how do you put this all together in making a diagnosis in this patient? Well, I was impressed by the rapidity of the patient's symptoms immediately after eating. The rather abrupt onset of upper abdominal cramps and pain, the sensation of upper abdominal fullness, along with the sudden and urgent diarrhea. All of these symptoms suggested to me that there was a problem with rapid emptying of liquids. As well, the late onset of symptoms suggestive of hypoglycemia gave the diagnosis away, which I believe is actually dumping syndrome. Why would dumping syndrome happen in an otherwise healthy young male? Well, what I think happened is that this patient had an inadvertent injury to his vagal nerve during the anti-reflux surgery. Remember that the vagus nerve has two trunks that traverse the thoracic cavity in close approximation to the lower body of the esophagus. 
and during the process surgically of looping a part of the stomach around the distal esophagus, it is possible to damage the vagus nerve. Fortunately, this is a rare complication of Nissan fundal plication, but it can occur. And so the resulting vagal nerve dysfunction drastically alters the ability of the fundus to undergo receptive accommodation. And so when liquids are swallowed, instead of a nice soft fundus to land on, the liquids essentially hit a hard brick wall and bounce off and empty quickly from the stomach. And so this rapid emptying of hyperosmolar liquid into the small bowel causes a number of important physiological alterations. For example, there is a massive fluid shift from the intravascular component into the intestinal lumen. This leads to small bowel distension and increased intestinal contractility, which is responsible for the nausea, the bloating, abdominal cramps, and explosive diarrhea. The fluid shift from the vascular space also leads to rapid heart rate and in some cases, postural hypotension. The rapid delivery of a high concentration of carbohydrate into the proximal small bowel also leads to a rapid rise in serum glucose levels, which stimulates insulin secretion, followed by reactive hypoglycemia. Are there any other causes of dumping syndrome besides vagal nerve injury? So, dumping syndrome is almost always seen as a consequence of foregut surgery. In the old days, when surgery was the main treatment for refractory peptic ulcer disease, dumping syndrome was commonly seen as a consequence of vagotomy and pyloroplasty or the Billroth gastrectomies. Currently, dumping syndrome is most commonly seen after bariatric procedures, such as the gastric sleeve procedure or the Roux and Y gastric bypass. Are there any diagnostic tests available to confirm the diagnosis of dumping syndrome? Primarily, the diagnosis can be made on the constellation of classic symptoms, like the ones I presented earlier. But in more subtle cases, the most useful investigation is a glucose provocation test. And typically, a liquid solution is given to the patient containing 50 grams of glucose. Dumping syndrome is confirmed if any of the following are observed, such as a rise in resting heart rate by more than 10 beats per minute within the first hour, reduced levels of blood glucose one to two hours after, or typical symptoms that occur during the observation period. So what is the treatment for dumping syndrome? So dumping syndrome primarily is treated with dietary modifications. In particular, separating liquids and solids is important. Patients should be instructed to avoid liquids for at least 30 minutes after a solid meal. Daily food intake should be divided into at least six small meals per day. Carbohydrate intake should be reduced with preference for complex rather than simple carbohydrates. Milk and dairy products should be avoided and supplementation with dietary fiber such as bran has been shown to be beneficial in the treatment of late hypoglycemia. More recently, some investigators have found acarbose to be useful. Acarbose is a drug used mainly for the treatment of diabetes. It's a starch blocker, and it has been found to prevent the late hypoglycemia found in dumping syndrome. Another medication, octreotide, a synthetic analog of somatostatin, has been found to be useful as well. It has a strong inhibitory effect on the release of insulin and several other gut-derived hormones. It's also been found to prevent the late hypoglycemia by delaying the maximal rise in plasma glucose level and by reducing peak insulin concentrations. Great, Dan. Thanks for the review of gastric emptying and dumping syndrome. This concludes our episode for this week. Thank you for joining us for another GI 101 podcast. See you next time. Bye. Bye.